What is going on, guys? The first week of NHL action is now in the books, so I thought I'd give you guys 10 key takeaways that I've had from this opening slate. And this isn't going to be overreactionary in the sense of like, oh, Sabres are going to miss the playoffs now, they're cooked, or the Canucks are a goddamn playoff lock. This is going to be a lot more tame than that. Just some some things that I've noticed about a couple teams and some trends, or maybe some players that are maybe primed for a breakout season. This is going to be based on, because it is only two to three games. You can't make massive massive takes after this you got to wait until at least a month in but without further ado starting off with the pretty obvious one austin matthews appears to be back two hat tricks in his first two games something that only four players in nhl history have ever done he seems to be that dominant 2021 2022 version of matthews you look at it against the canadians they were down they needed some offense late racks up goals, sends him to overtime. They go on to win in the shootout. He just took over that game. And then the Minnesota Wild, he also played fantastic and much more of an up and down high scoring affair. He got his three goals and you look at him compared to previous years. Something that's interesting. Obviously he has six goals in two games. Now last year, he only had one goal in his first seven games, went on to have 39 and 67 games. And then even when he scored 60, he only had one goal in his first six games and then scored 59 in the next 67. So you look at him, he's actually having a fantastic goal starting start to this season. Obviously, he's going to go through a, a cold stretch at some point. It's just inevitable. But the fact that he started off absolutely firing, I would set the bar the over under right now at 60 goals, in my opinion. Before the season, I said like 56, 57 was about a fair line. I probably would have still went over and sniffing 60. But right now, I think considering, again, such an insane start, 60 is about the is about the bar for Austin Matthews. Well, whether he will win the heart, that's another discussion. Ma- McDavid's going to start cooking eventually. But Austin Matthews seems to be much better. And something that is very interesting is that Alexander Ovechkin did this in 2018 and then went on to win the Stanley Cup. Obviously, I don't think Matthews is going to win the Stanley Cup based on this. I don't think that this really matters that much. But it is pretty interesting that only a handful of players have done this. And three of those players were like in the NHL's first or second season. So it's truly historic what he's doing. It's going to be interesting to see if he can carry it over. Speaking about McDavid, something on the Oilers, not really about him. But the Oilers' problems still appear to be pretty big problems. The goalie tandem was brutal. Campbell got the opening night start. He let in four goals on 16 shots, 750 save percentage. 8.73 8.73 goals against average, a negative 1.5 goal saved above expected. Then Stuart Skinner comes in. You think, oh, Stuart Skinner's going to be like he was at the end of last season and ball out. The playoffs weren't that big of a deal. He puts up a 750, a 5.33, and he has negative 4.7 goals saved above expected. They don't need these guys to be Vesna caliber. They don't need them to be Olmark and Swayman. We know this. They just need to play okay in net, literally give them like 908 goaltending and they'll be perfectly fine. But ever since the playoffs, that has not been the case. And again, if they don't get it together by playoff time, I think the Edmonton Oilers probably would be a first and second round exit. A guy that's really disappointed me in the first two games, Evan Bouchard hasn't been that good. Uh, obviously, I gave him a lot of praise because he was going to be on that power play. He was going to rack up points. I never said that he was like a top 25 defenseman, top 30 defenseman. I just said, he's going to get a ton of points and he actually is solid defensively. He's been a mess thus far. Matias Ekholm obviously came back in that second game. Hopefully, he can add something. He will add something and get him on the right, uh, get him, get him in the right direction defensively. But right now, it's kind of a disaster in Edmonton. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. They're gonna, they're gonna figure it out. They're gonna make the playoffs. They're gonna be able to outscore inferior teams just with that loaded offense. But right now, in terms of long term, in terms of playoffs, I am pretty concerned with the Edmonton Oilers. Next up. The Chicago Blackhawks not only have their forward franchise piece, but also potentially their franchise defenseman. I think not only Bedard, we'll go into Bedard first. Bedard, obviously three points, goal and two assists in his first three games. He's absolutely firing on net. His game is translating to the NHL level. Here he has 16 shots on goal. Here he has 2.1 expected goals, which is 30th in the entire league in terms of expected goals per 60 out of the 214 players that have played at least 30 minutes. So he is getting a ton of opportunities and he's not even scoring at that high of a rate. He's only shooting 6%, one out of 15. So I think the goals, all that's going to come to Bedard. He is well on pace to at least a 65-point season, in my opinion. I think it could go as high as 80 to 85. But Korchinski, he doesn't have any points offensively right now, but he has looked very good. And you got to realize, 
This is his draft year plus one, plus two. He's only 20 years old. He's already playing 20 minutes, 29 seconds a night. And he has looked very good. He is a great puck moving defenseman. He's actually looked solid defensively. But in terms of offensively, he's adjusted to the speed of the game. He moves pretty well. He has a little bit of a weird skating stride, in my opinion, but it doesn't matter. The results, the results speak for himself. He's still a fast player. He's still agile. He still can do all that. And I think he should probably get promoted to the top power play. I understand Seth Jones is the $9.5 million man, but just give the keys to Korchinski. Let him absolutely cook because the offensive talent is so prevalent with him. And again, this is his first three games in the NHL at 20 years old. He has really stood in. I'm not saying he's going to be the next Duncan Keith, but the Blackhawks clearly have something in Korchinski that's going to be a very good player down the line. The third, the fourth take, third take, fourth take, the fourth take is another defenseman. I think Brock Faber has also looked very good for the Minnesota Wild. You look at it, they lost Jared Spurgeon. There was some question marks about can they survive without Spurgeon going week to week. Brock Faber has really stepped up. He's playing 22 minutes and 58 seconds, and none of their games went to overtime. That was all during regulation, so he's playing legit number two minutes, number one minutes on some teams, and he has the second highest expected goals percentage on out of any defenseman. And on in terms of on-ice goal percentage, they've scored four goals with him on the ice, only allowed one. So he has really held his own. When looking at the Minnesota Wild, we all agree Addison had a solid rookie year. He's an offensive defenseman, like purely offensive defenseman, does not bring a lot of defense. He's one of the worst defensive defensemen in the entire league. If Brock Faber can be that next Jared Spurgeon for them, I'm not saying he's going to be as good, but he is well on his way to being a very good top pair guy, potentially to bridge the gap because Spurgeon is getting up there in age. Spurgeon's like 33 or 34 right now. Brodeen's even 31. So they need that next guy. We thought maybe it could be Addison, but his defensive deficiencies are so clear that he's probably just going to end up being an offensive defenseman power play guy. Brock Faber has the potential to be that legit number one defenseman in Minnesota. And I've been very encouraged from what I saw. Goal and an assist for two points in two games, as well as very solid defensively. Fifth take, Victor Hedman, another defenseman, appears to be back. Appears to be back. He leads all defensemen in points, in part because he has played three games. Guys like Quinn Hughes and another guy have Quinn Hughes and I'm blanking on the name, but Quinn Hughes has four points in two games. Edmund has one goal, four assists. I believe four of those points are at even strength in three games. And yeah, I I noticed him last night against against the Ottawa Senators. He appears to be moving a lot more fluid than, say, last year, a lot less defensive lapses from him. And I remember everybody was just writing him off after last season, after one bad season. The guy had 84 points the previous year, was easily a top five defenseman. Most years, he probably would have won the Norris in 2022, but Makar and Yossi were so insane. So Victor Hedman, him playing at a high level for the Tampa Bay Lightning, once they get Vasilevsky to get back, if they have basically two top 15 defensemen in Sergachev and Hedman, top 20 defensemen, we'll call it, that is going to be very good for them considering Hedman was very below average for his standards last year. If he keeps on keeps this up offensively, of course, I don't think he's going to put up 100 points like Eric Carlson, but if he can give them 65 to 70 points as well as solid defensively, they're going to be on their way to a successful season even if Vasilevsky misses some time. The sixth take, Arizona, well, I can't say they're a good team after one game. I think they're going to be a frisky team. They're going to be a very frisky team. Frisky means dangerous like like they're not they're not gonna be maybe consistent night in and night out but it's a team that you don't really want to see on the schedule because they have potential to really show up and ball out and yeah it starts with this the top nine is very impressive they're a very deep team a guy like logan cooley clearly is nhl level nhl ready i reviewed his tape i i think people were glazing him a little bit but he did rack up two assists he needs to adjust to the speed of the game and not play hero ball at times because he's not in college anymore but he'll get he'll get used to that in terms of Michelli is also looking fantastic. I watched that Devils versus Coyotes game in the top line. The top line is absolutely insane. You look at the top line for the Coyotes versus the Devils. The Keller, Schmaltz, Hayden line were at a 91.71 expected goals at five on five play. That is insane. Shot attempts nine to three, scoring chances five to one. They utterly dominated. Again, they were going up against the Devils top six and pretty good defense score. That line is going to take them very far this year. Last year at the back half of the year, they together combined for like about a point per game. Hayden was like 39 points in his final 49. Keller was well over a point per game. Schmaltz finished about point per game for the back half. So they are sneakily, 
they're not definitely not like top, top, top five line in hockey, but they're probably a top 10 line in hockey based on the chemistry that they have. And they could all realistically, Keller could go for 90, Schmaltz could go for 80, Hayden could go for 65 to 70. I could definitely see that. And now that they actually have some forward depth with Michelli, with Cooley, with Kerfoot, with, Z- with Zucker, with Kraus, they actually have a competent top nine. Will that goalie tandem in Vegmelka and Ingram hold up? I think they can be adequate. It's it's an average to maybe below average goalie tandem. The defense score, on the other hand, of of Dumba, Thursday, Balamaki, that's my probably my big concern right now. But again, they're frisky. I don't think they have the overall team to make the playoffs, but they're definitely a team that can give you a five piece in terms of goals any given night on like any given team. So they're definitely a dangerous team. Up next, the Canucks are going to be exciting. And dangerous. I, I, I wouldn't, again, similar to the Coyotes, I had them missing the playoffs by one point, but I'm definitely encouraged from what I saw from them. Obviously dominated the Oilers in the first game. That was an utter clinic, especially in terms of special teams. But yeah, you beat Edmonton twice. That's a quality win. That is quality wins. Thatcher Demko, although he is dealing with flu-like symptoms, in that first game, he stopped 21 out of 22 shots for a 9.55 save percentage. Even Casey DeSmith stepped in and kind of held it down for them. They actually have steady goaltending. That was my thing heading into the season with them. They were dealing with Spencer Martin, and I forget who the other guy was for most of the season last year. Demko started, stunk, stunk at the start of the season. If they get Demko can give them 915, the Smith can give them 905. They get about 911, 912 team save percentage. They are going to be absolutely cooking. If they can get that, I think they will be battling for a wild card spot and maybe maybe even in a divisional spot based on how LA looked. We'll get to LA later, but right now it's very encouraging to be a Vancouver Canucks fan for the first time obviously in a while. My eighth take is that the Boston Bruins are going to Boston Bruin. They're they're not they definitely don't have the offensive firepower of last year, but they're still just so fundamental in the way they go about playing hockey. They dominate shots. They have a 59.44% Corsi. And I know they didn't play the best teams. They played the Predators and the Hawks. But again, the thing with the Boston Bruins is they take care of business every night. They don't take games off. They don't drop points against the Chicago Blackhawks of the world. They just play such a stout physical style of hockey. And then that goalie tandem... Swayman stopped 35 at 33 out of 35 shots. Olmark stopped 20 out of 21. So you still have that great defense score. You still have that good, the great goalie tandem. You have top five defense score, top two goalie tandem. The forward core, as long as it's average, maybe even below average, they're going to win two to one games, three to two games, just because they're so stout defensively. Will that result in them going on a deep playoff run? I don't know. I think you do need somewhat of a prolific offense to win in the playoffs, go deep in the playoffs. But as of right now, I think people were sleeping on this Bruins team because they lost Bergeron, they lost Krejci, they lost Bertuzzi. But the defense score, besides Orlov and Connor Clifton, which isn't that much of a loss, is largely the same elite goalie tandem. They're going to be fine. They're going to be an elite team. They're going to take care of business. As for my ninth takeaway... I think the LA Kings, I, I, I'm not going to back back out on my 104 prediction. But they could be in trouble. What was the number one weakness with this team? It was obviously goaltending. Phoenix Copley looked brutal. A 737 and a, four, and a 4.66 goals against against the Hurricanes. A negative 3.1 goals saved above expected. That is... That is ass. That's ass. I, I <laughs> he he needs to give them at least 905 goaltending. Uh, Talbot was a little bit better, 889 and a 4.02. I think Colorado just looked fantastic in their first game against the LA Kings. But when looking at this team, they do need to get somewhat competent goaltending because I don't think they have the top end like like the Edmonton Oilers, the top end forward talent. Although they're they're very deep forward team, I'm not sure they have the elite forward talent or the elite defense talent to make up for such a, if they do end up having bottom five goaltending, that's definitely a major concern. I think they will figure it out. I mean, again, they did play the Colorado Avalanche and the Carolina Hurricanes, two very, very good teams, but I put them up in that echelon, in my opinion, in terms of being that good. I obviously think the Avalanche and Hurricanes are both better, but I expected the LA Kings to be a top 10 team in the NHL this year. Carolina game was more so on the goaltending. Colorado, Colorado just outplayed him fully. But at the LA Kings right now, you got to get some more production from Pierre-Luc Dubois. He has a goose egg right now. Kempe needs to start cooking only one assist. I think they're going to be fine. I'm not ready to fully panic, but the goaltending is definitely something to monitor. And then for my final take, Sergei Bobrovsky's playoff run was kind of a flash in the pan, eh? 
I'm not saying he's going to be horrendous like this all season. He has a 873 and a 3.64. That's obviously going to improve over the course of the season. But yeah, he's not. He, I, a lot of people, no one said that he was an actual top five goalie after that playoff run, but they thought, oh, he could be a top 12. He could put up a nine. 9, 10, 9, 15. But when you just look at him over the last five years, he's had like one or two decent regular seasons. But the last five years, he's been a 904 goalie with a 2.97. Like he is what he is at this point. He is an average to maybe even below average starting goalie for the most part. Yes, he can go on amazing runs. But considering the Florida Panthers are without Brandon Montour and Aaron Ekblad for a decent portion of the start of the season, they really need him to step up and make make up for that defensive deficiency for them right now. And that has not been the case. So they need him to really turn it around or else, yes, they'll get Montour and Ekblad eventually. And also Sam Bennett has been out. But if by then they are, let's say, let's say 5, 12, and 1 or something like that by the time Ekblad and Montour come back, that might be a little bit too much of a gap to make up for. So they definitely need Sergei Bobrovsky to step it up. But at this point, I think we can agree that last year was a Fugazi kind of run. So my 10 takeaways, Austin Matthews all the way back. The Edmonton Oilers, I'm definitely a little bit scared. Bedard, as well as Korchinski, look like future stars. Brock Faber looks like a legit future top pairing defenseman for the Minnesota Wild, which is great. Hedman is appearing to return to form. The Arizona Coyotes, well, maybe not a good team. They're kind of a frisky team. The Canucks are exciting. The Boston Bruins are still the Boston Bruins. The Kings could potentially be in trouble. And Bobrovsky kind of was a flash in the pan. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about these 10 takeaways? And what are some of your takeaways kind of to start the season, any teams that you're worried about, any team players that really impressed you, I want to hear from you guys in the comments.